we're now going to look at strength training. We've understood what the physical demands of hockey are. We've understood philosophically um, what the capability versus demand equation looks like. And so in this section, we're going to be diving into the sort of details of how strength training can look, how we make decisions around which exercises to pick, how to progress it, how to load it, and how we ultimately join those dots between what hockey looks like, what the demands are, and what type of loading the body requires to be adequately prepared for those demands. So we're going to be looking at some key principles, primarily looking at things like overload, specificity, and adaptation. We're going to be looking at a whole series of different movements and progressions, and how to structure training sessions in such a way that it meets all the demands of hockey, loads adequate areas of the body in the right areas, so that the at-risk tissues, for example, are fully prepared for hockey competition and high volumes of training. And then finally, the task at the end is going to be for you to kind of design your own training sessions. So for some of you, this may be a new challenge. For some of you, this may be something you're doing all the time. So hopefully for everyone, there'll be something which you can take away around how to build out effective strength training sessions and programs. And then in the next section, we'll be looking at conditioning before finally in section nine, pulling it all together into planning and periodization. And that's a high level view of how we construct an entire program. So if we start with just looking at the learning outcome, so I want you to be able to understand the principles behind strength training adaptation to begin with. Evaluate your current knowledge of strength training and how you can develop this moving forwards, whether there are little things you can tweak, and adapt, or whether there are some significant things you can look to implement. And then finally, to create two strength training sessions that meet the needs of the hockey player with a clear intended outcome again. And we'll be going through kind of philosophically what we mean by a clear intended outcome and how this can be aligned with adaptation principles. So to begin with, strength training is the use of resistance to increase the force potential of muscle tissue. Ultimately, the question must always be, what is the tissue experiencing? Um, not what implement we're using, or not what um, you know, latest method we might be picking. Ultimately, the only way or the only reason that your body will adapt is because the tissue experiences a stress. And that stress typically comes in the form of mechanical loading, and that mechanical loading leads to a cascading effect of chemical responses that leads to physiological adaptation. So the first and foremost thing to take home from, from this section already is we have to understand why a muscle adapts. And the only reason it adapts is because it's experienced a particular type of stress. And how that stress occurs is much less relevant than the fact that it does occur and that there are kind of key guiding principles around that that we must understand. So in terms of strength training more broadly, um, what adaptation does it create? There are numerous, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but these are some of the kind of key ones, neural adaptations. So in order to allow for things such as, you know, a greater number of um, motor units to be recruited in order to exert muscular force, um, what some of the adaptations enable a greater number of motor units to be recruited, which is good because that makes us more efficient at expressing uh, force. Tendon stiffness, if we have a tendon that is stiffer, it is um, less compliant, and that means that we can um, express and recycle forces through tendons much more effectively, um, and that translates to things like sprinting, change of direction, and other high intensity actions that we might be asked to perform on the pitch. Hypertrophy, which is increasing the kind of cross-sectional area of muscle tissue, um, again is of benefit because that increases our force potential. And if there's one thing to take from this section uh, fundamentally, it is this, that ultimately movement is based around force and equal and opposite forces. So and the only reason that a body will move again in terms of newtonian physics the only reason the body will begin to move is because a force is applied and the body will remain in that kind of state unless an external force is applied so all movement all sporting techniques are, are fundamentally underpinned by the ability to express force and on one end we have general force application like the athlete here doing a deadlift and then we've got specific expressions of force such as a shot in hockey where the way in which force is expressed and transferred through the kinetic chain is going to look a little different. 
and so there are subtleties in terms of how we go about preparing for that rate of force development this is now in relation to um, time frames so maximal force expression would just very simply be the total amount of force that we can express irrespective of time uh, whereas rate of force development is the rate at which within a time frame we can exert force and obviously sporting actions typically occur pretty quickly it's not like powerlifting where we might have a few seconds to express maximal force it may be something like you know 0.1 to 0.2 um, seconds to express high levels of force and so developing the ability to express force quickly is an important adaptation and then finally fiber type conversion which is um, essentially a physiological um, adaptation whereby certain fiber types can be converted to another so if we wanted to for example convert certain fiber types into faster twitch uh, fiber types which are able to express higher amounts of force then through specific types of training we can go about doing that so the body is highly adaptable and these adaptations can contribute to enhanced performance reduced injury risk which is all very positive how we go about doing that is the next bit we're going to look at though so there are many different things which we can do um, many different adaptations we can cause in the body via strength training there are lots of different types of strength training too though and when we're talking about using resistance the resistance can be in multiple different sort of methods again so these are methods of strength training resistance training is probably the most kind of obvious example where we're using an external load to resist muscle tissue so when a muscle contracts it's having to produce tension in order to overcome that load body weight again um, the, the key principles remain that if a muscle experiences high amounts of mechanical tension then uh, we can ex we can express greater levels of force through adaptation in the body plyometrics which is in effect any type of training whereby we're utilizing the stretch shortening cycle to express forces in short time frames and we're typically looking at time frames of less than 200 milliseconds so things like hops bounds skips um, getting off the ground super super fast is an expression of force in a short time frame and that's got very very um, important adaptations that contribute to things like improved acceleration and change of direction which is also very important so not only do we have to be able to express force in uh, in a maximal sense we also need to express force in short sharp time frames as well now in this section i'm not going to dig into plyometrics too much um, that's actually going to be covered a little bit more in other sections but needless to say plyometrics are extremely effective means of training and then lastly isometrics which is a specific muscle contraction type whereby we're trying to exert maximum amounts of force um, in an in a kind of state whereby the muscle does not change in length so if you imagine things like trying to push uh, against the barbell which is in a fixed position which is beyond our maximal capabilities to move that that load then our muscles are going to contract isometrically to do so and this is the most effective means of express of expressing the highest amounts of force so there's lots of different ways in which we can um, actually complete strength training as well the basic principles though that strength training is founded on again this is just recapping from the training principles section section three you've got capability versus demand so we're trying to increase an athlete's capability relative to the demand of the sport and that can be the capability of an athlete to express high levels of force it could be the capability of an athlete to tolerate um, high amounts of loading locally so for example in the calf we're trying to increase the, ca the capacity of that calf to withstand repeated loading and so we're trying to reduce the demand and increase the capability in that equation the said principle is important because we have to have a clear idea of the outcome we're trying to achieve and what adaptation we're trying to achieve so um, if we're not clear on that then strength training can be a little bit um, unclear and it may not be really achieving anything particularly specifically overload we must you know, we must include overload in order to um, enable adaptation so overload can come in the form of frequency volume and intensity and density like we mentioned previously and then lastly individual needs we have to base a strength training program on some sort of assessment and if we look back in the um, assessment section there are a number of movement based assessments as well as tissue capacity assessments that are going to help to guide us down a path towards improving the limiting factor of a certain athlete so for example if an athlete is extremely limited in posterior chain range of motion uh, then trying to load maximally through you know something like a hip hinge 
is probably not going to be an effective strategy because we're going to be loading at risk sites. So trying to increase the range of motion first would be a more appropriate means of going about that. So all of that feeds into making effective decisions. Again, to recap on capability business demand, in terms of strength training, if we look at the left-hand side, capability in terms of the questions we're trying to ask here is how strong, so how much force is the athlete capable of producing? Uh, what capacity do the local tissues have? So in a hockey sense, the at-risk tissues, uh, things like the calf, uh, adductor, hamstring, uh, muscle, muscles around the trunk, and then lastly, mobility and how much range is there possible? Because if we've got very limited hip range, then trying to maximally load someone in a back squat is probably not going to be a particularly safe means of loading the body because that stress is going to be put on other areas, probably the lower back. So understanding how assessment ties into this is also vital. Then on the right hand side, we've got the demand. So we understand now the injury risks, the tissue requirements, and the amount of force that's going to need to be expressed or is at least going to be expected of an athlete we can try to raise the left-hand side of the equation and then the training program is going to, again, bridge that gap and bring someone over from what they can do to what they need to be able to do in a safe and effective manner. In terms of benefits for hockey players then, what are the kind of key um, overall benefits? The first is obviously injury risk. We're going to reduce the risk of injury if we can increase an athlete's capability to tolerate the loads required of the athlete. So, you know, if we increase the force potential of an athlete who can increase the amount of force that the foot and ankle and the hip can express then when we're doing lots of high speed changes of direction we will place less risk on those tissues power so any kind of short you know bursts of um, effort like for example sprinting off the line accelerating quickly having to change direction and chase back and uh, win, a, win a ball win a possession those are short you know expressions of power and Force underpins power um, without getting into too much physics. Um, power is work multiplied by displacement and um, work is force times time. So if we can express, you know, lots of lots of force in a, in a short time frame, um, we are going to be able to increase the power expression of an athlete. And then repeatability, we're going to be able to do that again and again and again, the stronger an athlete is without fatiguing again we're trying to raise that ceiling so that every effort below that ceiling is relatively easier specific research in this area has also shown that um, strength training can increase agility strength and endurance in male hockey players so not only does it just increase strength as it as the um, said principle would suggest but it also has knock-on effects into other areas if we can express more force, then we can change direction more effectively. You know, we can tolerate eccentric loading more effectively, hence why agility might improve. We can improve endurance performance because, again, our uh, mechanical loading and efficiency of that mechanical loading is going to improve and we're going to become more economical with our efforts because, again, our physiological ceiling has been raised and we can tolerate loads a lot more effectively. So we know it has a direct impact on hockey performance in terms of the factors that are key. Changing direction at speed, uh, ability to express lots of force and be powerful and explosive, and also be able to repeat that over a long time frame with endurance. These are good, these are good things. Some basic strength standards now for hockey. Um, again, these are based on uh, s certain bits around some research, certain bits around a bit of experience, there aren't necessarily normative values for a lot of these tests, but they do give um, a ballpark to kind of aim for. If we're looking at lower body maximal strength, so maximum amount of force that you can express lower body wise, typically a one and a half times body weight squat or deadlift, so bilaterally, um, is a good sort of ballpark or a um, body weight and above split squat. So for example, a 70 kilo hockey player, um, would be looking for a 105 kilo back squat or a 70 kilo split squat and these are for one repetition or you know a few reps um at at, at sub maximal loads which would equate to the same loading one key point on this obviously that doesn't mean that everyone should be doing one rm testing and please make sure that if you do do one rm testing that it's done safely you know you're supervised by a coach and that you've done adequate preparation for it in the weeks leading into it. So 
you know, please just ensure that you're not um, going to the next session and jumping in and lifting maximally. This needs to be built up to and supervised appropriately. Upper body wise, uh, around the sort of eight to 10 chin up mark is appropriate. That equates to about a 1.2 times body weight um, system load. So if you include your body weight plus any external load and bench press of, again, body weight would be sort of appropriate there. The reason why these aren't like super high numbers, like two, two and a half times body weight is very simply because um, there's limited training time available for hockey players. You're training a lot and frequently. And there's also an, an element of diminishing returns in a sport that is basically dictated by technical, tactical outcomes, primarily um, trying to chase after a double body weight squat when you're already at one and a half times body weight probably isn't going to make an enormous impact on performance relative to spending more time on the pitch practicing with a stick and the ball because the technical element is so, so key. And that's why there's not, you know, a kind of an aim to try and get to double body weight. Now, it's not to say that getting stronger won't be of benefit, but these are these are kind of rough ballparks that give you an idea of the type of strength that would be appropriate. And then in terms of capacity scores um, for calf, 25 to 30 single leg calf raises, 25 to 30 single leg bridges for hamstring capacity um, is sort of in line with some normative values here. Adductor capacity and a Copenhagen hold, which we'll be covering um, later in this in this video, around a sort of 60 to 90 second hold. And then trunk capacity of around a 90 to 120 second isometric supine and lateral hold, which we'll be covering as well. If you had all of these different attributes physically, um, strength wise, you would be in a solid position. Now, that's not to say that you can't go above these. You know, if you're if you can do, say, 40 single leg calf raises, 40 bridges, that's fantastic. And, and then more is better. But it just gives you a, a ballpark to kind of aim for. There are some heuristics and a heuristic is essentially a rule of thumb to follow here. Um, and there are the sort of three R's that we can use in strength training to adapt, individualize and do what's called auto regulate strength training. Auto regulation means that if you're feeling fresh, then just because your session says four sets of four, that doesn't mean that the load needs to be the same as if you come in feeling really fatigued. It might be actually I'm feeling really good. And as we'll be talking through in a second, uh, there may be a few things you can do here that um, will help you to lift heavier on easy days and lighter on harder days, if that makes sense. So the first one is repetition maximum. And repetition maximum is the number of reps you can achieve um, at a given load or the, num the load you can achieve at a given number of reps. So, for example, one RM would be the highest load you can possibly lift for one repetition. And a three rep max would be the most load that you could lift for three repetitions. Reps in reserve is something we're we'll talking about, whereby if you aim for one rep in reserve as a strength training ballpark, it would mean if you did five repetitions at a load, you should only feel like you could do one more rep at the end of that set. If you could do more, then obviously the load would be too light. And then finally, rating of perceived exertion or RPE is a scale out of 10 that um, effectively measures how hard it should feel. So if you're lifting five reps at eight, an eight RPE, it should feel like eight out of 10 difficulty. So you know that if you're lifting a bar that's six out of 10, it's too light and you should be going heavier. So, for example, if we go through repetition maximum to begin with, um, going through in sort of order of um, loading, a one rep max is 100% of our repetition maximum. A three rep max is three reps, and that's going to equate to about 90% of one RM. A five rep max is going to equate to about 85% of one RM. And then finally, a 10 rep max is probably going to equate to about 70%. Now, this does differ by age, um, by upper or lower body loading. Males and females are a slight differences here as well. But as a ballpark, this is kind of what you're aiming for. So if you had three reps on the program um, at 90% of 1RM, this would be maximal lifting. No reps in reserve, absolutely maximal um, effort on this. 
Now, that would probably only happen once in a whole training cycle. You wouldn't be doing this all the time. It's extremely nearly fatiguing. So typically you might have something like three reps at um, 85%, which equates to one rep in reserve. So in other words, you're going to be lifting heavy, but at the end of the set, you should have one rep in reserve. And if you don't have that, you need to lift the load, uh, sorry, reduce the load a little bit. And if it is two to three reps in reserve, you're not lifting heavy enough. So these are useful kind of rules of thumb to use. So again, with reps in reserve, one rep in reserve would be one more rep possible, two reps in reserve, two more possible. And for general strength training exercises, try to keep to one to two reps in reserve unless you're lifting maximally. If we're always lifting to failure, then we're going to massively fatigue ourselves and it's not a very sustainable way of training. If we're always training with, say, three reps in reserve to five reps, we're probably lifting not quite heavy enough to really stimulate adaptation. And there may be times where that's appropriate, but in general, one to two reps in reserve is about right. And this can be equitable across all different rep ranges. So if we're doing three reps at one rep in reserve, it's going to be the same relative intensity as if we do um, eight repetitions with one rep in reserve there as well. So we're always just trying to keep one in reserve so that we can keep stimulating, but not completely um, cooking ourselves and leading to too much failure. One thing on that, though, depends on the time of the year. So, for example, during the season, we definitely want to keep a few more reps in the tank, whereas in the off-season or pre-season, maybe there are times where lifting maximally would be appropriate. RPE, then, lastly, is a way of measuring and scaling um, how heavy something should feel. So 80% of one RM at one rep with one rep in reserve will probably feel like an 8 out of 10 RPE. So it should feel like an 8 out of 10 difficulty. So it's really, really hard, but you've got one more in the tank. It should feel like an 8 out of 10. 70% um, would obviously be with two reps in reserve would be about a 7 out of 10. So it's still still kind of pushing the load quite a bit, but you you wouldn't feel like super, super difficult. 60% of one RM with three reps in reserve would probably feel like a 6 out of 10. And then 50% with five reps in the tank is probably going to feel like a warm-up load. So super, super easy. And that's not really strength training. And it's also not a stimulus um, or threshold stimulus to target high, th- high threshold motor units either. We need to be lifting above 60% in order to do so. So really, that would be too light to stimulate adaptation. But that gives you a useful kind of ballpark of the kind of loads that, that stimulate overall. Loading parameter-wise then, um, hypertrophy, typically we're looking at anything between three of three to five sets, the six to 12 repetitions with around one rep in reserve. A lot of research more recently has demonstrated that actually hypertrophy can be achieved at any given rep range. Um, so we can actually, we can generate hypertrophy at, at loads heavier than six RM or, you know, in the three to five rep range. But generally speaking, um, a six to 12 rep range uh, is a sort of appropriate one as this enables us not to lift too heavy to cause too much neuromuscular fatigue. Um, obviously just trying to keep one rep in reserve with hypertrophy proximity to failure is key so trying to ensure that um, you know you've got close to failure and on occasion going to failure is okay but just not all the time because we said that is quite neuromuscularly fatiguing when we're lifting maximally the key principle is high mechanical tension so we need a lot of muscular tension in order to stimulate adaptations that lead to increases in strength so two to five reps with zero to one rep in reserve is probably going to be about right. Three to six sets, a little bit higher volume on the high side. Power is all about um, you know quality reps and may even involve things like cluster sets where we do one rep at a time with a 15 second recovery just so we can ensure that the movement velocity remains high because that's the kind of the key bit if we're trying to um, lift a bar at high velocity over a large displacement which is the kind of way in which power is produced power is obviously measured in watts not force and um, we need to be lifting a bar quickly over a large area hence why things like olympic lifting is one of the most effective means of developing power tissue capacity then finally is high volume local muscular endurance work so we're now looking at the kind of 12 to 20 repetition ballpark um, or 20 to 30 seconds with one to two reps in reserve as well, two to four sets of that. So that gives you an idea of how a program can overall look. If you're going to order these, if you wanted to try and target all of these in one session, which I wouldn't recommend, but sometimes you have to, then power would sit on the top because it's the most amount of neuromuscular 
uh, you know, freshness required, then maximal strength training, then hypertrophy, and then tissue capacity. What's needed for a hockey player in a strength training session overall are these kind of eight key categories. Uh, that's because on the left-hand side, these are our kind of fundamental movement patterns that just are the foundation of developing large amounts of force because they're multi-joint, which enables us to um, generate more force over more joints. Then on the right-hand side, we've got our tissue capacity exercises that we need to be also working on in order to develop the capacity of muscles that are potentially at risk and help to safeguard against injury at key sites. So we've got a squat hinge push-pull as the sort of first part of the session, and then calf hamstring adductor and trunk work as the second part of the session, which will show in just a second how you go about putting these together into sessions. But this is also what we need now. So we're going to start from heavier work into lighter work. And just to go back a step, the loading parameter wise, we're probably going to be sitting in sort of the strength and hypertrophy bracket for our main exercises and then tissue capacity bracket for our accessory exercises like these. So let's look at the different movement patterns now and how we can put these all together. So how do we order these? It can look a little bit like this. So we will have, if I just move myself out of the way, um, squat hinge and push pull movements are our kind of max force um, slash hypertrophy, depending on the kind of the kind of stage of the season. Uh, these are our main exercises that we're trying to get after in order to develop high levels of force expression. And I'm going to give you some examples of these different categories in just a second. Um, and on the bottom here, we have our tissue capacity exercises and the key areas, again, is the calf, hamstring, adductor and trunk. So as you see what happens here, the volume will be going um, down a little bit as we move down here. So there's more time allocated to the maximal strength and the tissue capacity work, potentially. The force is highest up here because we're looking at movements that enable us to produce much more force. So, you know, a, a back squat, for example, versus a single leg lower you know clear, clearly there's a lot more force here these are a lot more neural at the top these are a lot more morphological at the bottom what we mean here is that we're trying to stimulate neurological adaptations or neural adaptations sorry and then morphological in other words at a tissue level we're trying to create change in things like cap uh, capillarization um, and increase mitochondrial density so there's a slight change in how we need to go about that and again in terms of that specific adaptation to impose demands principle in order to create morphological change, we need lots of volume. And in order to create neural adaptations, we need high mechanical loading. So low repetitions, high amounts of force. So these are our different um, movement patterns. So now you've got me modeling um, these different movements. We can break the split the squat down into bilateral and unilateral movements. So at the top, we have um, a bilateral back squat, for example. Then we've also got a front squat. And then we've also got um, unilateral movements such as a barbell split squat. So we can categorize the squat into these different subsections of unilateral or um, indeed a bilateral squat. Why would you want to pick one or the other? Again, this is where the individualization comes in. This might be due to um, age, it might be due to what you're trying to load. You know, a split squat can be a really effective way of loading in the adductor if that's you know, identified in this area of, of risk. Um, or if just generally we just need to increase global strength, then sometimes a bilateral movement is the best way to achieve that. Personally, I tend to bias towards some single leg movements because hockey is essentially always in a split squat stance. So trying to get really strong in the split squat will be a, a really effective means of developing kind of a more quote unquote specific strength. But both are important. So ideally, if you have two sessions in a week, you know, one could be dedicated towards bilateral heavy back squatting, front squatting, and one could be dedicated towards some heavier split squats. Okay, then we have the hinge pattern, and the hinge pattern is essentially a um, flexion at the, hip, at the hip whilst keeping our back in a neutral position like this. So we have, again, bilateral and unilateral movements. And on the top here, we have our Romanian deadlift. At the bottom here, we've got a split stance Romanian deadlift. And again, the benefit of this split stance position is that we're able to load one hip one hamstring um, a little relatively a little bit heavier which can be useful and again in a split stance position this is possibly more relevant to hockey so again if you wanted to kind of lift twice a week and we're going to try and hip hinge twice a week 
on one way I like to do this is if you have a bilateral squat in one session, you can have a unilateral hinge and then a unilateral squat with a bilateral hinge. So something like a barbell back squat with a single leg um, RDL. And then in the next session, a Romanian deadlift with um, a split squat, for example, is a way of ensuring we can hit both in the week. But again, which one you pick is kind of dependent on level of experience and that kind of thing. And also just to kind of reiterate that the movements can be loaded in lots of different ways. So you don't have to just necessarily use a barbell. You can use dumbbells. We can use a body weight movements if we're if we're a youth athlete or a beginner, um, and various other ways, bands and, and all sorts of other things. But these are our kind of foundational movements: squatting and hinging. Then got pushing and pulling, and by pushing we mean upper body pushing. So we've got this can be broken down to vertical and horizontal. So vertical meaning overhead and horizontal meaning out in front. Um, so we've got a shoulder press or a single arm overhead press. We can break it into another subcategory, which is bilateral, unilateral, vertical or horizontal. So a shoulder press would be a bilateral or vertical push. A single arm overhead press would be a unilateral vertical push. A bench press would be a bilateral horizontal push. And a single arm chest press would be a unilateral uh, single arm horizontal push. So we can break down into these different categories now. So if we now want to look at push and pull movements, as similarly as we did with the, the squat and the hinge, we might have on session one, we might be looking at uh, vertical movements. We might be doing an overhead push and an overhead pull. And in the next session, we might be doing pushes. It might be a horizontal push and a horizontal pull, for example. So that's a couple of ways we can go about that. And again, we might kind of mix it up in terms of the bilateral and unilateral um, elements. So if we're doing a heavy bench press, then something like a single arm bent over row, which is a, a horizontal pull, might be a good kind of one to um, kind of pair with. So then if we do look at the pull kind of movements, we have vertical and horizontal again. So a vertical pull would be like a chin up. So again, pulling overhead and bringing yourself up. A single arm lat pull down would be, again, a unilateral vertical pull. And then we've got an inverted row, which would be um, essentially like a inverted bench press and a single arm bent over row. Now, all of these movements, you can very easily go onto YouTube and find lots of videos of them. But needless to say, try and keep it simple and have your kind of key movements in each category. So the key ones in terms of hockey are gonna be a single arm bent over row, a chin up, uh, and then something like a bench press uh, and a overhead press. So just keep it nice and simple in terms of the movements that you pick. All we're trying to do is just load effectively. Okay, in terms of calf then, we have many, many different ways that we can load through the calf. We've got a single leg calf raise, we've got things like a calf uh, leg press ISO, which is pushing against a heavy leg press um, at a load at which we're just about able to hold it, but so it's a heavy load. So we're not trying to do a calf raise, we're just pushing against it for say up to five seconds at a time. Barbell calf raises, like just bilaterally, and then walking calf raises, which are a little bit more dynamic. So there's lots of different ways we can load up the calf, but based on the kind of, you know, the, the nature and anatomy of the ankle joint, effectively all we can do is go up on our toes and down again. Um, in order to load it so we can either do that dynamically eccentrically or isometrically in lots of different ways so there are many ways in which we can load and again if we're going to load the calf twice a week which would be my recommendation once a week maybe you're doing a single leg calf and another day doing a bilateral calf raise uh, hamstring then lots of ways we can do this from simple to more advanced movements we've got a single leg bridge uh, as, as is in the photo here, and this is also an assessment, which, you, which you've already mentioned for capacity. We can do it isometrically and hold the positions to kind of challenge the muscle to um, work isometrically for long durations. We could do things like a single leg RDL. And we can also do things like Nordic curls, which are a much more advanced uh, movement. Now, all of these are subtly different in terms of the aspect of the hamstring they're trying to load. So something like a bridge is quite a hip dominant movement because we're essentially trying to load from from the hip primarily same as a bridge eye so a single leg rdl um again is very much that kind of 
um, upper portion of the hamstring at the hip. Nordic curls, however, is a much more knee dominant movement because the knees stay fixed whilst we load eccentrically down through the hamstrings. So, and they all provide different stimuluses for the hamstring. And so, again, trying to mix it up um, and doing bridges, hip hinges and Nordic curls in combination, along with things like sprinting, straight leg runs, is probably going to be the most effective means of developing uh, hamstring capacity and strength. So no one is better than the other. Nordic curls get a lot of um, kind of attention because they've had a lot of research done into them. They're incredibly effective means of injury prevention, but they are extremely advanced. They're also a super maximal exercise. So, um, you know, you wouldn't throw an athlete straight into these. It's something to work up towards. So developing capacity first is by uh, by a long stretch the best approach here. Then we have the adductor and the adductor again is super important because we're always in split stance and it's at risk because we're often into these kind of low positions and hip flexion. We can load this in lots of different ways, but the Copenhagen is probably the most effective exercise for this, which is like a side plank with your leg, top leg raised up. Lateral lunges, as in the photo, a wide stance split squat, because if we're in a wide stance, um, in other words, your front foot quite far out in front of you, you can load quite effectively through your adductor, which then gives an opportunity to add more adductor loading. Um, and a high box step up again, because we're going into lots of hip flexion. So the, the key principle there is, Loading unilaterally in deep and deep hip flexion is a great way to target the adductor because it helps as a synergist in hip extension there. And the adductor magnus is a very big force producer. So there are four kind of different ways we can load it. And that's, again, isometrically and dynamically and statically and versus through range. And then finally, we've got different ways which we can load the trunk. So we've got, for example, here, single leg lowers and side plank pulses like this. Um, and the benefits of this is that we need to have some sort of anterior trunk component and some sort of lateral trunk component. The reason why I haven't included a specific posterior chain component is because if we're doing plenty of things like Romanian deadlifts um, and other kind of exercises like that, we're actually getting quite a lot of posterior trunk um, involvement. And it's actually the thing which is loaded a lot in hockey anyway. So potentially adding more load to it isn't necessarily the right thing because we're trying to almost encourage uh, lumbar muscle work there because we're trying to work, ensure that the other muscles that contribute towards spinal stiffening are going to take over some of that work to help to prevent lower back injury and not necessarily not to necessarily just contribute to adding more load to it. But there are certainly time and places where you would want to do some specific lower back um, loading as well. But generally speaking, if we're going to do a trunk circuit, which I recommend, then Mixing it up with different variations of trunk exercises is super important because otherwise it can be quite kind of mundane and repetitive. So changing the type of leg lower, changing the type of plank uh, variety, different kind of side plank movements, different kind of lateral trunk holds is a great way to ensure that we're keeping that varied. And uh, the best way to approach a trunk circuit is to aim for a certain number of repetitions or a certain duration of time and try to complete either time or repetitions um, within that time frame. So if we're going to do a 10 minute circuit, we might aim to do 250 reps. Or if we're going to do a 200 rep circuit, maybe we're going to try and aim to do that in six to seven minutes. And so we can try and chip down the time um, or chip down the reps or increase the reps already during that time frame. So different ways in which we can keep that engaging, um, all about trying to reduce the risk of uh, lower back injury primarily and just keeping us strong for good force transmission through the trunk. Okay, when it comes to different sort of training frequencies, we can also uh, put this together in different ways. So what if, let's say, it's during the off season or a period where we just want to really prioritize getting stronger and we want to try and lift four times per week, we could approach it in this way, which would be two upper body sessions and two lower body sessions, sorry, two upper and two lower body uh, strength sessions on, say, a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So we're obviously giving ourselves the rest days on a Wednesday and then Saturday, Sunday. So we would then have, if you look at the lower body sessions, we'd pick something like a bilateral squat, so like a uh, back squat, a hip hinge 
some sort of hip hinge variation, a, a unilateral squat based movements so that could be like a single leg squat, a split squat, um, reverse lunge, that kind of thing. Then a hamstring calf adductor and trunk. In the upper body, then we'd have um, that should be um, push pull push pull, not push pull 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 pull, um, but essentially two different pushes and two different pulls with two different shoulder health exercises, which we haven't really gone into, but needless to say, things like band pull aparts, face pulls are good old good sort of options here to kind of keep that shoulder nice and healthy. Again, some core work to finish up with, and then we just vary the lower body strength um, sort of session here on the Thursday. For example, um, we could then have, um, rather than the back squat, we might do something like a leg press, which would be you know, a good alternative then, or rather than doing the bilateral hip hinge, we might do a single leg RDL, and then so on, add some variety with all of these different exercises and variety with these ones here. So that could be a four-day split. Three-day split could then be like a total lower and upper type approach. So we'd have squat, hinge, push, pull, calf, hamstring, and trunk kind of set up. Lower body wise would then be the same from the four day split, and then also the upper body would be the same for upper body split. And then lastly, for the two day split, we could have just two total body sessions. Why not have one upper and one lower for two? Um, very simply, it's because if you were to miss one, you would then not load that part of the body for another week, um, which is a significantly long period of time not to load it for. Whereas if you have two totals, even if you miss one, um, it will only be a few more days before you then do it again. So you get more frequency of loading, which helps to reduce the risk that you would just basically not, not do any calf loading for like up to two weeks, which would be a problem. <laughs> so that's how a two-day one would work. What about including hockey? Then how would it look? Now, obviously, I haven't included things like conditioning because we not haven't got onto that yet. And in the final section, this is all going to come together. So don't worry about everything just for now. But if we just wanted to do strength training and, to and on top of hockey, then... If we had the typical sort of Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday match split, something like a Monday, Wednesday would be a good opportunity to load this. It gives us 48 hours in between sessions. It gives us um, 72 hours between the last strength session and a match. And it gives plenty of recovery time between the sessions as well and recovery around the match, which is the priority. So that's kind of how you might put it together if it was that way around. Maybe the match would be on a different day, but overall that's kind of how it might look. Then we've got a couple of little frameworks to finish up with, and this is kind of how you might make decisions around putting this all together. And this is relatively high level stuff. So if this is way beyond kind of the level you're at currently, don't worry, don't use it. But this is just if you're thinking that I'd really like to have a nice framework to make decisions around um, training in general, then this is one that I would use. So we start on the left hand side and the framework, and this is going to be including the task, by the way. So do check that one out. We start with the question, the intended adaptation is, and we're trying to be specific here. The ultimate bit we're trying to get to is to pick an exercise and how we're going to load it in order to achieve the outcome rather than starting with exercises, which is often what people do. Now, I know in some ways I've just gone through lots of different exercises, but you'll see how we start to join all this together now. So let's say, for example, the intended adaptation is to... Um, increase calf capacity because based on assessment an athlete can only do 18 calf raises and we know a benchmark is 25 and so they've got a at risk uh, part of the body and so increasing calf capacity is our intended adaptation the reason for that is as i've said there's an at risk site we know hockey has got you know 30 up to 30 percent of injuries are ankle related so having high uh, calf capacity is really really key the importance relationship to performance is this is a high risk site, so if we don't um, increase capacity of the site, then there's a risk of getting injured. And if a player gets injured, they can't perform. So that's a relationship to performance. The principles we'll shape the program around are well, we need some overload. So an athlete can only do 18 reps, so we need to be, you know, pushing the volume and pushing the frequency there. Um, we also need to understand the said principle, which is specific adaptation to impose demand. So if you want to try and increase the capacity with the need to do lots of high volume, low load loading of the tissue. So the loading parameters we're going to use based on those principles are going to be um, four sets of 90% of total reps to try and really get some load into those tissues. So that's probably going to be around four sets of 15 uh, with under a minute's rest between uh, sets. 
and we're gonna use a little bit of external load as well to kind of challenge the tissue. The exercise we'll use to drive the adaptation is we're gonna use a single leg calf raise um, because it's the simplest means of just getting plenty of effective loading into the calf. Our coaching uh, considerations here are, let's say the athlete has had ankle injuries previously, um, the consideration is gonna be around messaging. So, you know, things like the reason why we're picking this exercise is because we're gonna to try to reduce the risk of injury to keep you on the pitch more. You know, that's a very clear message. Other coaching considerations are gonna be, it's gonna be quite tough, this kind of exercise. So how are we gonna approach it in terms of messaging? We're probably gonna talk about intent at the beginning. So, you know, this, you know, this kind of loading is gonna get pretty challenging. Um, so, you know, just try to really consider about, you know, keeping really, really quality uh, repetitions going, even when you're starting to fatigue. Uh, maintain effective tempo. So when you're starting to get fatigued, don't start to go for kind of quick, short reps. We're gonna try and stick to that one up, one down tempo, even when you're getting fatigued. And then I might need to provide a little bit of encouragement, and motivation as it starts to get pretty fatiguing. So that kind of gives you a model around how you might approach coaching that exercise. Confidence in the program, pretty high now. I'd probably say this is gonna be, you know, 10 out of 10. I know exactly what I'm trying to achieve with this exercise. I've gone through this framework. I've understood what principles I'm trying to operate around. I have assessed it. I know what the capability is. The loading is relevant to that. I've thought about my coaching considerations. So I'm feeling like a 10 out of 10. This one exercise, I'm really confident on. Obviously then we have to think about the whole framework though and how it fits into the entire program. But I hope that gives you a useful framework for making good decisions around exercise selection. So individualizing sessions, there's a couple of extra bits uh, to finish up now. One way we can individualize the sessions, obviously, is through movement progressions. So maybe a back squat versus a goblet squat. You know, the high level athlete, you know, maybe maximal loading, you know, three reps in a heavy back squat would be appropriate. Whereas for a youth athlete doing 12 repetitions of a, of a basic goblet squat, holding something out in front of you would be appropriate. Loading wise, again, as I've said, you know, heavy loading for advanced athletes, body weight or light loading for beginner athletes. Total volume of work, you know, if someone's work capacity is high, we can push them a lot more. So again, if you've got an advanced athlete and they can do, let's say 30 sets of work, which is quite high versus 20 sets um, for a less experienced athlete. And then the said principle, obviously you've mentioned there around, you, know, you need to have calf, hamstring, trunk loading. Well, if one area is particularly problematic, maybe we would just ignore the other areas and just focus on that one. So it could be that, let's use the calf ankle example again. If someone can only do 12 to 15 repetitions, but the other scores are pretty good, we might just ignore the loading of the hamstring and trunk for a couple of weeks and just do two circuits worth of calf loading at the end. And that's gonna make it you know, much more specific to the individual again. So you don't just have to go through a tick box irrespective of what the assessments tell you. You have to make sure that you adapt the program as necessary. But the main kind of cornerstone should remain pretty much the same. So an example strength session I'm bringing it all together might look like mobility prep at the beginning and movement prep. So again, you know, do revisit the movement prep section to look at how you put together, you know, a hip, thoracic, ankle mobility sort of session here of around probably 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to do a split squat of five reps per side. That's your squat movement, a barbell RDL of six to eight reps. And then going to do a chest press and single arm row. And then we're going to finish up with our calf, um, hamstring and trunk. Uh, sort of volume work, 15 reps in the bridge, 15 to 20 in the calf, and then 10 minutes worth of trunk loading at the end. Now, again, I haven't included plyometric training in this, and the simple fact is that often it works best with things like speed sessions. So that's what we're going to cover off in the speed um, speed se uh, section of this overall um, sort of course. So that's where we'll go into that more detail. So you can add plyometrics in, and it would probably sit um, between movement prep and your first main strength exercise because you want to be doing it whilst you're fresh. So lots of references, we're going through lots of content there, but hope that's been useful. Check out these papers, they're excellent. Um, in summary then, what we need with strength training is to ensure that we've got a framework to use, we've got a framework for decision making to use, we understand key principles around adaptation and strength training and just training more generally. We need to understand what overload really means and how we can do it. We need to have, have sort of linked assessment to what a program looks like. And we need to have a kind of 
a, a theme and a thread throughout it. So when we're messaging to athletes of how we've built the program, it's crystal clear and concise and there's lots of clarity, which is super, super important. Task-wise, just want you to create two strength training sessions then based on what we've spoken about. Again, with that clear intended outcome. What I've given you is the framework I've gone through there with you. But if that's too high level and confusing, I've just given you a little table to fill in and you can just create two simple strength training sessions to complete. Um, and if you're unsure of anything, just drop me a message. In the next section, then what we're going to look at is conditioning for hockey and how you can assess, prescribe and execute an effective program. So this is going to be quite a kind of meaty section where we look at running assessment, different types of conditioning sessions and how we piece all of it together. So again, I hope that's been a useful and insightful overview of strength training for hockey. Watch it back through a few times if if there are any bits that, you know, are a little bit unclear and I hope that that has kind of covered off all the main areas. So as I say, the next bit we'll look at conditioning and then lastly we're going to look at planning and periodization and tying all of this together now into how we actually build an entire programme.